Nehemiah chapters 9 and 10 can be divided into two parts. The first is extensive corporate confession of sin, and the second is the renewal of the covenant. Let's begin with the former. Here the priests and uh, leaders under the leadership of Ezra still are leading the people in corporate confession of sin. There is time for hearing the Word of God and studying it together, and then in this magnificent prayer, the leaders bring together a combination of endless biblical allusions and real freshness in prayer. You know how it is. Sometimes you find people who have memorized a lot of Scripture and who pray in scriptural cliches, and other people sound very fresh but not very biblical. Here, these people manage to do both. That is, there is scarcely a verse that does not make allusion to antecedent Scripture, to earlier Scripture, often picking up the prayers of David or Moses or Hezekiah, those who have come in the past, picking up their language, and yet the whole thing sounds spectacularly fresh. But perhaps the two most remarkable features of this prayer of confession are, first, its focus on the history of what God has done. Do you see, any people, any culture, any country can look back on its own history in quite different ways. We could do it here in the U.S. Canadians can do it in Canada. The Chinese can do it in China. You can look back at your own cultural history and be very proud of it. Think of all the kinds of things for which uh, you are renowned, which are your cultural strengths and so forth, and treat them all with a great deal of pride, nationalism, patriotism. But it's also possible in any country to look back at the things for which we ought to be ashamed, where we've been wrong or sinful or greedy or made mistakes, and then we should ask for forgiveness. Now, there are quite a lot of these sort of historical surveys in the Bible that try to draw the people of God to admit their sins. You might read Psalm 78, for example, at your own leisure, and discover that as Psalm 78 goes through the years of the wilderness wanderings, in part the purpose of Psalm 78 is to lead the people of God to, to genuine repentance. In the New Testament, when Stephen gives his speech to defend what he's doing in Acts chapter 7, he gives a kind of potted history of Israel in which he points out that again and again and again the Israelites killed the prophets or rejected the revelation that, that came to the people of God and so forth. And his point is, in the light of that history, it's not too surprising if when the Messiah comes, he's pretty broadly rejected too. In other words, there is a kind of set of theological lessons to learn about our own culpability and complicity in sin by reviewing history with a certain kind of humility of mind. That's what this corporate confession does. It focuses on God's kindness again and again, again and again, not only in creation but in the call of Abraham and in the giving of the law and the rising of the people. Uh, to become a, a, a nation, the giving of the kingdom, the establishment of the Davidic dynasty, but again and again the move of the people as a whole is toward idolatry. And as a result, the people have ended up in exile and crushed, and they're still under the sway of, of regional superpowers, even if some of them at least are back in the land. And it is within that matrix of perennial, persistent, idolatrous folly that the people are led to corporate confession of sin. But there's a second element in this corporate confession of sin that is worth reflecting on. The chief thing of which they repent is idolatry. It's not that they repent a whole lot about uh, how many times they've shacked up with people they shouldn't have shacked up with, or how much greed there has been in the marketplace, or how often they've told lies, although all of that sort of thing is embraced. But all of those things view sin primarily in terms of horizontal deformations, horizontal abuse, whereas in Scripture the sin above all sins, the sin that lies behind all the other sins, is idolatry. It's the rejection of God and His way. That's why Jesus insists that the first commandment, that is first in importance, is the commandment to love God with heart and soul and mind and strength. If we were to keep that commandment perfectly, there would be no other sin. 
And when we commit any other sin, that one has already been committed. That fundamental rejection of God and His ways is the very heart of idolatry, making something else more important than God, whether ourselves or our desires or our daydreams, our fantasies, whatever. Somehow God is de-godded. He's debunked. He's overturned. Maybe not according to what we say, but according to how we act. We can, in fact, begin to act like practical atheists, even though with our mouths we're still Christians. Now, it's that sort of thing that is at the heart of the confession that you find in Nehemiah chapter 9. The leaders of the people lead the people in a kind of confession of sin whose heart is idolatry. And they recognize the punishment that they are currently enduring is something that they deserve, but they ask God for mercy and for grace to overcome their terrible straits. Then from chapter 938 to chapter 1039, you find the renewing of the covenant. This is quite remarkable. There are some verses in this chapter that acknowledge that in the renewal of the covenant, there must be a recommitment to obey all the law of Moses. Here, for example, in chapter 10, verses 28 and 29, not only the leaders, but all the people gather together for the sake of the law, we're told, for the sake of the law of God, joining together with their wives and all their sons and daughters who are able to understand. All these now join their fellow Israelites, the nobles, and bind themselves with a curse and an oath to follow the law of God given through Moses, the servant of God, and to obey carefully all the commands, regulations, and decrees of the Lord our God. So that's the sweep of this covenantal renewal. And yet, as you read the rest of the chapter, you discover that almost all of the space is devoted to the temple, to providing adequate supplies and support for the staff and uh, the animals for the sacrifice and making sure that the thing is organized so the right families bring in the needed wood for the burning and so forth. That's the whole focus on this covenantal renewal. And from our vantage point, we might, we might start to ask ourselves, why the emphasis here? Why not on um, praise or why not on the demand for personal integrity or honesty in business relationships or sexual purity? Why is the covenant renewal focused on the temple and maintaining the sacrificial system? But when you look at things from the sweep of the Old Testament, it's obvious why the focus is here. If sin is first of all idolatry, then our problem is alienation from God. Of course, sin brings with it all of the horizontal machinations and corruptions and deformities, the war and the hate and the lust and the killing and the greed and the racism and all the rest. Yes, that's true. But at the heart of all of it is the de-godding of God. So what we need most in salvation then is to be reconciled to this God. It's not just a question of getting our social relationships right. It's how do you get reconciled to this God? How is sin forgiven? What enables us to stand before this holy God in His presence? And in terms of the Old Covenant, it's through the sacrificial system that God Himself has ordained and provided through the law of Moses, the tabernacle, and then the temple, and so forth. Nehemiah is astute enough to understand that. If these people are not reconciled to God, then even if there are social reformations and they have a wall built and they have sentries posted around the gates and so forth, they don't really have all that much. They must be a people in covenant faithfulness with the living God. And that means that at the heart of their lives must be the temple with the sacrifices that God has ordained, where they confess their sins. The priest offers the sacrifices, for example, on the Day of Atonement, both for his own sins and for the sins of the people. And people confess their sins before him and are reconciled to him. The temple was the great meeting place between God and sinful human beings. And this was provided by God's own great design. So that's what this covenantal renewal is about. 
Now then, it's worth making a jump to the New Testament. How does the New Testament pick up on these things? And I'm going to suggest three ways. There are lots of them, but I'll mention only three. First, in the New Testament, Jesus is presented as the ultimate temple of God. So, if the temple of God in the Old Testament is the meeting place between God and sinners, there is a sense in which if Jesus is now presented as the temple of God, He's the meeting place between God and sinners. So in John 2, when Jesus says, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up again, nobody understood what He was talking about, but John comments, after He has risen from the dead, then the disciples understand the Scriptures and believe what He's saying and see that He's actually talking about Himself as the temple. He has constituted the temple precisely by His own death, by the destruction of His body and rising again three days later. Now, in the New Testament, there's a derivative sense in which the church is the temple of God. That is the meeting place between God and the world. Where does the world meet God? In the context of the church, which becomes the temple of God, the meeting place between God and sinners. And in one passage, even the individual Christian's body is considered the temple of God. That is, it's the meeting place between God and other people. That is, this is the temple of God. It is to be holy, and this is where others come face to face with God as He has disclosed Himself through Christians, as through the church, but supremely through Jesus, the the great temple of God. In the New Testament, Jesus is the ultimate priest, He's the ultimate sacrifice, He's the ultimate king, but He's also the ultimate temple, the meeting place between God and human beings. That's one of the connections. But there's another connection. This great feast of covenant renewal following corporate repentance takes place at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, one of the great stipulated Old Testament feasts. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says some very interesting things at one of the feasts of the tabernacles that take place during the time of His ministry. You can find the account in John chapter 7. There he says, on the last great day of the feast, that is the Feast of Tabernacles, that if people come to him, he will pour out the Holy Spirit on them. And if you look at all of the surrounding language, Feast of Tabernacles, manna in the previous chapter, the promise of the Holy Spirit, and array of other things, all of them are found in Nehemiah 9 and 10. It's as if John, in putting all of this together, is saying, do you want to see not only the ultimate feast of Passover in Jesus' death, but the ultimate feast of tabernacles and the ultimate manna and the ultimate giving of the Spirit and the ultimate pouring out of the water of God? Do you want to see the fulfillment of these things? See what Jesus is doing. See what He is promising. And then you can go one further through a complex argument that shows the role of Melchizedek and the sweep of the biblical history. The writer to the Hebrew shows that if you change the nature of the priesthood in the Old Testament, the entire law covenant must be changed. That's Hebrews chapter 7, verses 11 and 12. In other words, the law covenant is so tightly tied to the priesthood and the temple structure and all of the sacrificial system that goes with it, that if you change the priesthood, you change the entire structure of the old covenant. You are required to adopt a new covenant. And then Christians can't forget that on the night that He was betrayed, Jesus took bread and broke it and said, this is the new covenant in my blood as He takes the cup in His hand. In other words, There is a new covenant that is introduced by Jesus Himself that is built out of the structures of the Old Covenant with many lines of continuity and some lines of discontinuity as Jesus comes to fulfill the structures of the Old Testament that are reaching their climax now under the ministries first of Abraham and then of Moses and then of David, and now at the end of the exile, restored under Ezra and Nehemiah, waiting for the the climax to, to come to its fulfillment in the person and work of Jesus Christ. 